So I'm going to uh, speak about another approach to elevating um, consciousness uh, beyond the uh, uh, sense-desire plane. And that's the practice of the Brahma Viharas, the Divine Abidings. These are uh, four states that are um, that have been called the skillful emotions and said uh, by the Buddha that the wise person always dwells in the Brahma Viharas so the implication here is that these are the only four emotional states that are completely skillful. Um, <clears throat> and these can be developed as meditations and we'll talk about that, uh, how to you know, formally develop them. But first I'd like to uh, clarify somewhat or what we're talking about, what the four Brahma Viharas are. Metta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeka. Metta is uh, generally translated as loving kindness. That's the most common translation. Um, and it's often the case that it's not really an adequate or perfect translation. Uh, the definition of metta is that one has an earnest wish or aspiration um, that beings be well and happy. So it's a kind of benevolence or well-wishing. And it's uh, important to clarify what uh, what it is and what it isn't. Um, <clears throat> uh, like all the Brahman Viharas, metta to be spiritually effective, it must be universal. You can't have uh, metta for these kinds of beings and not those. And expect it's going to uh, be spiritually powerful. I, I had one fellow tell me he could have metta for all kinds of beings except for mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's not good. <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the right attitude. Well, metta is not the same thing as uh, uh, loving a person in the ordinary, you know, mundane sense of the word, it doesn't mean that we want to associate with the being or that we approve of the being's behavior. It has nothing to do with it. Uh, for example, we have in, uh, in one of the Paritta chants that we do, um, that we did in Thailand, the protective chants, um, wishing metta to the four families of snakes and to scorpions and spiders and all manner of beings whether they be uh, six-legged or eight-legged or four-legged or two-legged or no legs um, and wishing them all be well and happy but may you stay well f well away from me <laughs> 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 basically the implication of the, the chair is um, you have metta for a scorpion doesn't mean you want to take it into your sleeping bag and cuddle with it. You know, this is not uh, uh, metta is not liking or approving. It's just wishing a being be well and happy. 
and even if a being is uh, behavior is very bad, you don't approve of it, they're harmful, they're vicious in the world, you still wish them to be happy, but well away from where they can do any harm. You know, just may you be peaceful, may you be happy. In, uh, in the case of all the, uh, the four Brahman Viharas in the text in the Vasudhi Magga that's uh, describing these states, they talk about what are called the near enemy and the far enemy. These, the far enemy is an opposite mental state that's obviously uh, negative or wrong. So for Metta, the opposite mental state is uh, uh, hatred, right? or, uh, you know, the opposite of well-wishing, you wish harm on a being. Um, but the near enemy is a mental state that has some characteristics the same as metta and could be mistaken for it, and that is uh, partial affection. So you can you have you have uh, <coughs> metta for butterflies, but not mosquitoes. It's not. Uh, you know, it's not. Um, uh, truly metta. Metta is, has to be universal. May all beings be well and happy. <clears throat> and uh, it's a very important for all of these Brahma-viharas that you uh, initially have metta for yourself. But may I be well and happy. This is an absolutely crucial first step. And it's something that uh, a lot of people in our culture have kind of negative self-image. They're hard on themselves. So it's, it's very difficult so for some people to really rouse that up. But it's, very important. It's actually the prerequisite. You can't, you can't properly have metta for anybody else unless you have it for yourself. And if you truly have metta for yourself, you can't, you can't stop there. You can't be selfish with it because your own being is too small a vehicle to hold it. it it's a, it's a. Another name for these states is the boundless states, apamana. They tend to be very expansive. So once you have metta aroused for yourself, it'll spread naturally. You know, you'll begin to feel more of well wishing to other beings. So metta is. Wishing well, may all beings be well and happy. The second state is karuna, which is translated compassion, and that's not bad, but it's again slightly misleading because the uh, the English word compassion it comes from a Latin root; it means to suffer with. And compassion should, shouldn't make you, in, in the Buddhist sense, karuna shouldn't make you suffer. Um, the earnest wish here is may beings be released from suffering. So it's uh, a variant from metta in that now we're focusing on the suffering aspect of beings and all beings in samsara have some degree of suffering. Some have a lot some have less, but all beings have some degree of suffering. And you are rousing an earnest wish, may they be released from their suffering. And again, you start with yourself, it's very important, may I be released from suffering. There's all kinds of suffering, mental suffering, physical suffering, suffering of uh, deprivation, and so on. 
<clears throat> and again, it has to be universal. You got even uh, wrongdoers that uh, cause the suffering of others. They are creating suffering for themselves with uh, terrible karma that they're making. So they're also deserving of compassion. <clears throat> The far enemy of karuna is cruelty, which is uh, a little different than hatred or ill will. Cruel, hatred is just, I don't like this being, I don't want to be around them, so pushing them away. But uh, cruelty is I want to make them suffer. <laughs> no, so it's, it's worse. Uh, so cruelty is actually wishing suffering on beings. Um, and the near enemy is pity, or well, the English word pity, not uh, poly pity, so totally different. But, uh, pity as you know, being maudlin about suffering of beings and taking on vicariously the suffering. Right? This is uh, the idea. Of the whole Buddhist teaching is about reducing suffering in the world. This important thing is that reducing and ending, making an end of suffering. So we don't want to increase suffering. If you see beings in suffering and it makes you sad and, and uh, teary-eyed, maudlin about their, their suffering, then you're increasing the suffering in the world by taking it on yourself. And it doesn't help. It's not a, not a help to anybody. So <clears throat> the idea is not to rouse that, not to take on vicarious suffering, not to suffer with, as implied by the English word from the Latin, but to uh, have an earnest wish may means not suffer. Yeah. This can be uh, a motivating factor for action in the world if, they, you, know, if you are able to re release beings from suffering, helping them in some way, and a karuna as a motivation for action is skillful. But it can also just be a mental state as in a meditation, just developing the sense of karuna to make beings be released from their suffering. The third one is mudita, is translated as sympathetic joy, and this is the earnest wish that beings continue to enjoy the happiness they have attained. So this is like the flip side of karuna, it's focusing on the um, uh, joyful aspect of beings. Um, beings, except for the ones in the very lowest hell realms, all beings will have some degree of pleasure and some beings will have a great deal of pleasure. And we're just... Uh, vicariously uh, wishing that they enjoy, they continue to enjoy the, suffer the, uh, the happiness they have attained. And this, uh, any kind of happiness, it includes just worldly happiness. The example given in the Vasudhimaga is one sees uh, someone ri uh, riding down the road on a richly adorned elephant. And so you rejoice in their attainment of wealth and prosperity and that they, you know, well you've got to bust a down old donkey but you're still you're happy to see your, you know, this follows on, a, on an elephant um, the far enemy is envy that's quite obvious you know if you see someone on a richly adorned elephant and it makes you angry and upset to, well how come he's got these things and I don't and, you know, this is the opposite state the near enemy is vicarious enjoyment. And this is likewise with the um, karuna. You don't, you, you have, it's a subtle trap. You don't want to then turn it into fantasizing about enjoying these things. You, know, you, you don't start vicariously fantasizing about riding on the elephant. You're, you're just happy that the other fellow's got, got an elephant to ride on. And um, 
This is uh, Mudita. Uh, people often say they find Mudita hard to get you know, to develop as a meditation, um, but that um, if they can get it going, it's very uplifting and brightening to the mind. You know, it's very good if you can develop this. They, it's very good for overcoming you know, negative states of mind, depressive, depressive states of mind, or, you know, despair, you know, develop mudita and just kind of blow away the cobwebs and brighten the mind. <clears throat> so these first three are all variations on a, on a theme, basically, and um, they're all based on some kind of an earnest uh, wish. An aspiration. May beings be well and happy, may they be released from suffering, may they continue to enjoy the happiness they have found. The fourth one, Upeka, is uh, different. It's a, a, on a different level than the other three. And according to the Vasudhimaga, the Vasudhimaga treats it like a kind of a, a graduate school that, that you have to first master one of the other three before you can do Opeka as a meditation. I don't know if that's completely true. I think it's helpful to develop Opeka at any time. But it is a, 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 a subtler, more refined state of mind than the other three because it involves no aspiration. It's merely being present with the reality of beings. Upeka is equanimity, and it has different aspects. Uh, there are different kinds of equanimity. They're all called Upeka, but in different contexts. There is the upeka as a feeling tone, which is just neutral feeling, can be called upeka. That's the simplest, most basic form. Uh, there is is the upeka towards objects of consciousness. That's what you develop in vipassana meditation, a new, specific neutrality towards objects, non-reactive to what it is. Non non-judgmental, non-discriminating, non-reactive um, uh, non to the objects. Just each object is taken on its face value. And what we're talking about here with the Brahma Viharas is equanimity towards beings. So it's recognizing that aspect of beings which is universal. Now, we, we know that, obviously, in samsara, there's a multitude of beings, and no two are exactly alike, and there's a wide range of animals, humans, dewas, ghosts, so it's an extreme range of different kinds of beings who have different capacities, different strengths and weaknesses, different pleasures and pains, different karmas and histories. But they are all the same in that they all experience suffering and want happiness. They all, and they're all subject to the karma that they have made. They are experiencing the fruits of the karma that they have made. So they're, uh, exist, they're conditioned. They exist by cause and effect. So there's a fundamental way in which all beings are the same, the universal aspect. There are other aspects you can highlight that where beings differ, but here we're looking at how beings are all the same at the, uh, what that aspect which is universal. You regard beings in that way. The traditional contemplation for that is that to focus on karma and say that all beings are heirs to their karma, subject to the karma, are experiencing the karma that they have created. But in 
another way of looking at it is all beings are the same and that they just want happiness, don't want suffering. And it's a universal quality of all beings. So, this is um, so far been speaking about definition of terms. Now I'll speak about developing Brahma Viharas as meditation objects. And we'll mostly talk about the first three because they're all done in the same way, variations. They are variations on the same kind of process. And the first thing to note here is uh, these meditations are classed also as samatha meditations. Um, and uh, the correct object or nimitta of the meditation is a mental one. It's the feeling tone to develop this uh, feeling of metta or a feeling of karuna. <laughs> so uh, anything else is a means to an end. And there are uh, different ways of, of developing these meditations, different uh, methods that have been developed. using either recitation or um, visualization, etc. But what you're trying to do is to develop this feeling. And there's a, there are, I would say, two general approaches. One is a specific uh, meditation, developing uh, the meditation on specific objects meaning individual beings. One goes through a list, there's a um, traditional list that you go through, you begin with yourself. So with Menta, may I be well and happy. And uh, stay with that as long as it takes to raise this feeling. And I think it helps with these, with all of these Bhavavara meditations if you Begin by centering your consciousness in the middle of the chest, like the heart chakra. You center your consciousness there and uh, try to develop this feeling. And you'll know when you have it, this kind of glow, this warm feeling, may I be well and happy. You've got that going. Then you, you hold that for a while, then you go through the list. The second one is... Uh, someone you regard as a teacher. And the third is your parents, if they are still alive. If not, you skip that step. You do, you do not offer Brahma Vihara meditations to the dead. Uh, the practice for the helping the dead is to make merit. The danger is offering metta or karuna to the dead is if they're in the ghost realm they're going to hang around feeding off that energy and they're not actually going to move on so you're actually thwarting their further evolution so you don't don't offer metta to the dead so you, your parents if they're still alive then the third one the, the next one after that is a dear friend someone who you have naturally have warm feelings towards. And you're cautioned here also to avoid someone you might have romantic or sexual feelings for because it can turn easily into lust. So as someone that who's a dear friend but not you're not attracted to them sexually. They're either the wrong gender or just the wrong age or whatever. Um, then uh, a neutral person, someone who is 
you don't have strong feelings about one way or the other. You can pick someone like a, a face you can remember from seeing in the street, or you pat, you exchanged a few words with a shopkeeper or something. Just someone quite neutral. And then the last one is the enemy person, someone that makes you angry, who's you know been cruel to you or causes you trouble. Someone you have difficulty with. Then that's the final one, and you're trying to develop, you go through this list and it's, the idea is to start from the relatively easy ones to go to the hard ones at the end. And the uh, objective is to break down the barriers, meaning that you feel the same feeling tone towards all of them. You don't have any preferential, you don't have more metta for the dear friend than for the enemy feel exactly the same towards all of them. That's the ideal you're working towards. May they be well and happy. And remember, that doesn't mean you approve of them or like them or want to hang around with them. It means that you wish them well. There's a story in the Vasudhimaga about the monk who developed the perfection of this um, breaking down the barriers it says he was traveling it's, it's quite an artificial situation set up here but it's for the purpose of the story he's, you know, he's traveling and he has uh, three companions one of them is his dear friend is a, a boyhood friend and they both ordained together and they in the same monastery for a long time the second one is a random monk from somewhere else that they picked up on the road. They don't know him at all. He's just hanging around with them. And the fourth one is this old crabby monk who's always been giving them a hard time, criticizing them and complaining. So the four of them are traveling together, and they're uh, this one who's like the center, the actor of the story. He's captured by bandits who belong to this uh, thuggy cult of, that does human sacrifices. <laughs> and they tell him, uh, we're going to sacrifice one of your company to our dark god who's thirsty for blood. And um, uh, you can choose which one, which, which one of the four is going to die. And, you know, what do you think he said? A lot of people would jump in and say, well, he should sacrifice himself. Well, that wouldn't be correct. That's, again, preferential. But he said, oh, I can't make up my mind. It doesn't make any difference. You just pick him by chance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is the breaking down the barrier. He has no discrimination between the four. He feels the same for all of them. It's sort of a gruesome story, but the, a lot of the Buddhist stories are that way. <laughs> it, it would work the same. It would work the same if it was a positive reward. Someone was going to get some kind of wonderful gift. He had to pick. You know, it would be the same thing. So I just choose by chance. Um, So that's going through the list, and you can do that with any of the three meditations. Uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you another anecdote. This, uh, I was at, years ago, I was at a, a conference with other bhikkhus, and um, one of the one of the monks had arrived. You know. Uh, by air that day and he had told the story that he was sitting in the airport he got detained at the airport because he was sitting waiting and he saw the uh, cops going around with a uh, sniffer dog and you know, they sniff for drugs and explosives and he was practicing metta meditation and he sent metta to the dog <laughs> <laughs> and the dog came over and muzzled him <laughs> so, so, so the cops are like okay you <laughs> <laughs> so, so that uh, one of the elder monks was giving a talk about metta and he said now remember when you're doing metta there's three classes of people you avoid 
the dead, someone who can arouse lust, and drug-sniffing dogs. <laughs> 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 so uh, that's um, that's the idea of developing uh, developing uh, Brahma Viharas by going through the list, and this this method uh, is probably the best if you want to develop if you want to take it into jhana, you can go into first jhana with the metta meditation because the object is very defined and specific. Um, the other method is uh, being called the uh, extension by general pervasion. And you're not using specific individuals in this, but you're s spreading out the Brahma Vihara increasingly out in wider circles to encompass all beings. And you begin again with yourself, you establish it towards yourself, and then you spread it out to the immediate vicinity, I mean, all, the, all the beings in this room, and then extend it to wider and wider circles, like all the beings in this neighborhood, and in New York City, and in the state, and in the whole continent. And by stages, as, as you go gradually you know, to the whole earth and then uh, to the whole universe. Um, and the idea is you start at, with yourself and centered in the heart chakra and you're radiating metta from your heart to fill, fill the, the space and the, ma the mature developed form of this meditation is you're radiating metta universally in all directions and um, you're trying to include all beings seen and unseen human beings those lower than human those higher than human and animals and Ghosts as well as Devas and Brahmas and fill the whole cosmos with metta radiating to infinity. So this is a truly a boundless state, boundless meditation. This isn't as f focused as the other, but it's very expansive and very brightening to the mind. And it's a... Uh, uh, very powerful if you can get it going to um, elevate the state of consciousness so you're feeling you're feeling very spacious and, and, and vast you're really tapping into that uh, expansive aspect the vastness you're radiating in to the ten directions of space And um, I would recommend if you do this meditation, when you break the meditation, not to break it off suddenly, but to bring it back. Like you're radiating to the universe, <clears throat> then bring it back to, to this earth, and to this city, to this room, and to myself. And you can bring it back much more quickly than you brought it out. But to get yourself grounded again and you end the meditation with a few breaths noticing your heart centered on your heart and may I be well and happy and end the meditation so you don't you don't uh, you're not left feeling like spaced out <laughs> don't leave your consciousness somewhere on the other side of Alpha Centauri <laughs> bring it back to ground it here on the that. And this can be done with any of the uh, any of the three meditations, Metta, Karuna, and Mudita. And you take it, you can take your time with it. Don't don't rush it. Take it out in stages. 
and that you can use verbal recitations in the mind. May all beings be well and happy, great or small, near or far, seen or unseen, you know, humans, animals, birds, insects, spirits, ghosts. You know. and <clears throat> And you can you know, take it out gradually and you know, use whatever ever feels natural to you and, and allows you to use it as a vehicle. Visualizing, visualizing rays emanating from the heart center filling out the universe is, is really it's one way, you know, and uh, try to keep it, once you get to the expanse about to the, spreading it out to all directions to infinity, try and hold it there, you know, that's the mature meditation, that's the actual meditation. This is the boundless state, you know, apamana, without, without boundary, this is considered infinite. The, uh, the fourth one, Upeka, is not so easy to develop as a formal meditation, but it's, a, it's more of a reflection that you can bring up uh, at any time. Um, <clears throat> by uh, the, there's a there's a, uh, a talk that the that I, I read a transcript of, it was given by the Dalai Lama, and he was talking about this, developing equanimity, uh, and he talked about the, the way to do it is one being at a time. So you uh, regard beings in a, you're in, you see you're in a, a crowded place, you're in the subway train, and you look up and down and just think each, of each individual being each person you know, uh, um, just wants happiness, doesn't want suffering. You know? um, develop it, you know, one being at a time so specific. You're noticing, so then you're, you're focusing not on the various characteristics of individuals, but on their universal aspect. Um, one, of, one of my teachers he had a kind of a playful way of of uh, doing this. He he had a he he taught a a little mantra you you can do when you're in a crowded place and kind of just kind of scan the, the faces of people and think to yourself, "Here a Buddha, there a Buddha, everywhere a Buddha, Buddha. <laughs> I'm a Buddha, you're a Buddha, everywhere's a Buddha, Buddha." <laughs> Well, it's the same idea. <laughs> because this is another aspect of beings that's universal. The beings have the uh, what Mahayana calls a Buddha nature, but all beings have citta. They have uh, consciousness. There, they have a, a spark of awareness. Even the lowliest being has this kind of spark of citta, and is focusing on that. They all, each one, is a in itself is in a sense a universe of experience. <clears throat> so developing any of those first three Brahmaharas will also, over time, tend to open the mind to an understanding of equanimity of beings as well, because you're breaking down the barriers, you're trying to uh, make this these feelings universal, both in terms of space and in terms of, of uh, multiplicity of individuals. 
I mean, all beings, each and every single individual being, be well and happy. May they be free from suffering. May they continue to enjoy the happiness they have found. And all these states of mind are very useful for overcoming negativity, uh, for uh, freeing yourself from anger and ill will and uh, hostility. You have to uh, develop these feelings of metta, karuna, mudita. So um, I think that's all I'm going to say about those states. It's something for you to another tool to, to work with. So we're going to go to it's now it's